Final Fantasy XVI is now less than six months away from being released, and with it amongst the five nominees for Most Anticipated Game at the Game Awards, it's clear that there's a high degree of anticipation and intrigue both from within the fanbase and the wider gaming community. So far, this has been driven by four trailers, a small array of interviews conducted by the development team with select publications, and off-the-cuff comments made by Naoki Yoshida during live streams pertaining to other properties. Those trailers have been viewed millions of times, and the interviews have created lots of discussion, but there are still plenty of question marks surrounding Final Fantasy XVI, and its success feels far from guaranteed. Now, given that Final Fantasy XVI is being developed by core members of the team who pulled Final Fantasy XIV out of the critical gutter, that might sound like an odd thing to say, but from reading through the various interviews conducted with the development team, even though they have expressed confidence with the approach they're taking, they are more than aware that it may not please everyone. And based on what has been seen so far, in terms of how fans have reacted to the various Final Fantasy XVI initiatives that have happened over the past two years, that sentiment has been quite clear. And that brings us to this particular video and a wider initiative that we've been working on. Following the release of Final Fantasy XV and the Final Fantasy VII Remake, we conducted surveys with the hope of presenting a constructive and data-led view of how players felt about various aspects of those games. We're planning to do something similar for Final Fantasy XVI after its release, but to add an extra layer, we wanted to survey fans ahead of the game's launch to understand current sentiments and how they change over time based on marketing initiatives, and of course, the quality of the game itself upon launch. Beyond that, and this is more of a pipe dream, but with so much time left until the game launches, there's also the chance that Square Enix can use this data to adapt how they choose to talk about the game in the build-up to launch. The initial survey was released not too long after the Ambition trailer had been published, but with Square Enix then publishing the Revenge trailer at the Game Awards, we decided to run a second survey. We ended up having over 5,000 people take part, not an insignificant number considering the game hasn't even been released yet, and it's a testament to how supportive you all are with this kind of endeavour, so a big thank you from us. With that, here's the structure of the video. First, we're going to break down the core segments we've identified and will reference throughout the video itself. We'll then use this as an overlay for our analysis of how people have responded to the various trailers, while also discussing some of the more extreme decisions the development team have made. Focus will then be placed around breaking down individual design elements before we wrap things up by highlighting what people want to see from 16 moving forward. There will also be timestamps in the description if you want to skip between the various sections. The three key segment breakdowns we will be using throughout will relate to geographic location, age, and franchise entry point. With regards to geographic location, it won't come as much of a surprise to learn that for both surveys, the lion's share of respondents were either based in Europe or North America, but there were still enough responses from people based in Asia, South America and Australia to be significant. When looking at age brackets, 95% of the votes came from just three groups, 18 to 24 year olds, 25 to 34 year olds and 35 to 44 year olds. Analysis will therefore focus on these three groups. There were responses gathered from the other groups, but they felt too low to be significant. Either that, or in the case of the 13 to 17 year olds, as the game is M-rated, it's not really meant to be played by that specific age group. The final breakdown will be the entry point. As perhaps expected, this has a heavy skew towards the so-called golden generation, but even though that may be so, Final Fantasy 7, 8 and 10 only represented just over 50% of responses, with the remaining being made up of older and newer entries. For example, Final Fantasy 15 was the fourth most popular entry point, showing the impact of that particular entry in terms of bringing new fans into the franchise. So far, Square Enix has published four trailers. The first, dubbed Awakening, was published over two years ago now, with the other three, dubbed Dominance, Ambition and Revenge respectively, all being published within the past seven months. To judge the effectiveness of each trailer, and to understand how opinions have changed, if indeed they have at all, we will be using multiple data points, including but not limited to the two surveys we conducted. This means that first, we will look at a broad data set, YouTube. Specifically, how the trailers have performed across official accounts associated with PlayStation, Final Fantasy, Square Enix Japan and Square Enix West, and also the two biggest Western publications, IGN and GameSpot. Collectively, across these six channels, the trailers have been viewed over 20 million times, with the Awakening trailer accounting for over half of these views. 
Amongst the three more recent trailers, this means that there has been a notion of diminishing returns. There was a 60% reduction in views of Dominance compared to Awakening, and a further 20% reduction when comparing Ambition with Dominance. Revenge has seen this drop much further, but given how recent that specific trailer is in comparison to the others, it's a bit too harsh to judge it by the same metric. However, based on how it's trended, it's difficult to see its view count surpassing any of the previous trailers. Some of this will not be too surprising. After watching the initial trailer, people will have made judgments about whether they're interested in 16 or not, and this will influence whether or not they want to watch further trailers. Those that were interested and wanted to learn more may have also reached a point where they just didn't want to learn anything else, either because they weren't impressed, or the opposite, they didn't want to be spoiled. To address this, Square Enix will need to find some way of re-engaging those who have already tuned Final Fantasy XVI out for some reason or another, and connecting with those who haven't so far been interested in the game in general, something that will be easier said than done. The other, perhaps more interesting aspect, relates to how well people have responded to the trailers. But for this part of the analysis, we will unfortunately need to remove Square Enix Japan, as they don't allow likes or comments on their videos. The balance between likes and dislikes can often be a tale of extremes on YouTube, especially when fans want to show their displeasure for something and are emotional about the content. But outside of those scenarios, it's far more common for videos to receive a high ratio of likes in comparison to dislikes, and as such, it's more about the fine margins. As one of the biggest drivers of awareness, it's easy to see this when looking at how audiences have reacted to reveal trailers over the past two years. For this particular piece, we're looking at PlayStation 5 reveal or announcement trailers on the official PlayStation channel that have received more than 2 million views and a like to dislike ratio of at least 90%, as, well, the graph would be quite heavily skewed by games like The Last of Us Part 1. Here we can see that over half of the trailers have received a 98% like ratio, with the cream of the crop trailers getting very close to, or even just sneaking into, the 99% range. However, trailers that were less convincing start to tail off, and that's where the Final Fantasy XVI Awakening trailer sits, only receiving a better like to dislike ratio than Project Magnum, a game people are unconvinced will even release, and Lords of the Fallen, a sequel with a murky development history. Widening the net, views of the Awakening trailer on other YouTube channels were much less generous, with those who watched via the official Final Fantasy channel some of the harshest. However, even though Final Fantasy XVI did get off to a rocky start, the wider response to the three more recent trailers has been far more positive. Outside of a blip, which saw GameSpot viewers just not vibe with the Ambition trailer, almost every source has been closer to the 97% mark, with those who interacted with the Dominance and Ambition trailers on the official Square Enix West channel going much higher. And when compiling all of the likes and dislikes across all of these sources, even though gamers still didn't seem overjoyed with what they were seeing, something that would have put Final Fantasy XVI in the realm of games like Marvel Spider-Man 2 and God of War Ragnarok, they are much, much happier than they were. Going one level deeper, a similar trend has been witnessed on our own YouTube channel. Within a few days of each new trailer being published, we asked fans to grade beyond simply asking whether they liked or disliked the trailer. From this, it's been clear that the Awakening trailer just did not resonate with fans, but that with each trailer, there has been a clear trend of improvement. And that brings us onto the survey itself, and how respondents felt, having had a bit more time to mull things over. In the initial sense, the trend was the same as those who had responded via our YouTube community posts, albeit with even harsher scores. And when we asked people the same question within the second survey, with the Revenge trailer now released, the positive trend could also be seen. But here's where things get interesting. When looking at the scores given within the second survey, the ceiling hadn't been raised. Instead, the Revenge trailer had made people view the previous trailers in a more negative light, and it meant the score awarded to the Revenge trailer had just replaced the score previously awarded to the Ambition trailer, as opposed to coming in much higher. Breaking things down by age group, we can see that the trailers have resonated more with younger fans than older fans, those in the 18 to 24 group rated each trailer higher than every older age group, with the variance becoming more pronounced with the newer trailers. Amongst the older age groups, things were a bit more mixed. The same trend was there before the Revenge trailer had been published, but after it was published, one of the more intriguing elements is that it seemed to have a more pronounced impact on those in the 35 to 44 age range. This led to them rating the trailer higher than those aged 25 to 34, as well as leading them to view their older trailers more positively. What's also intriguing about all of this is that it goes along with the grand design. 
As mentioned earlier, the Final Fantasy XVI development team are aware that the game they are making may not please everyone. Part of this is due to legacy decision making. Over the past 20 years, actions taken by those overseeing the Final Fantasy brand have created fragmented expectations amongst an ever-expanding fanbase. And it's become very muddied as to what a Final Fantasy game even is anymore, as different people want different things. As Yoshida noted in one of the interviews, to some people, Final Fantasy is turn-based gameplay centered around commands. To others, gameplay doesn't matter in a Final Fantasy game as long as there's airships, Moogles, Chocobos, and a character named Sid. The other reason the game may not appeal to everyone is the active part the 16 development team are themselves playing. Reading between the lines, they feel as though Final Fantasy has become stagnant, and the only way to change this is to make some quite extreme changes so that the brand will become relevant again. It will see them flat out abandon turn-based gameplay and command-based gameplay in favour of a fast-paced action-orientated experience. They must be aware that this will ostracise some older fans, but the rationale given is that they believe it will help them to accomplish the wider objective of making Final Fantasy appeal to younger fans. Based on the data, this approach appears to be working, but it's a risky move. And Square Enix must be happy enough that there will be some collateral damage when it comes to antagonising existing fans, as they feel it's necessary to help Final Fantasy transition to the demands of modern gamers on a global scale. That risk can be displayed when segmenting the data based on franchise entry point. For this, we have excluded games like Final Fantasy 2 and 5 which had a low volume in terms of respondents, but for the games that remain, it's quite clear that those who had either Final Fantasy 14 or 15 as their entry point are much happier with what they've seen from 16 than any other entry point. This makes sense on both fronts, as 16 is being developed by the same team as 14, but in the case of 15, that game attracted people who enjoyed action RPGs, and 16 promises to be more of the same, just better. Every game released before 14 is quite consistent with the opinions of the respondents, and this is most likely because they were all command based games as opposed to action based games. The data does also illuminate though how much opinions have changed between the first and fourth trailers, with those who had 15 as their entry point increasing from 82% approval to 91% approval, and those fans who had a pre-14 entry point are now feeling about the same as 15 fans did after its initial reveal. Time will tell whether Square Enix can push those opinions even higher. The other way of looking at this in more literal terms is by seeing whether or not people feel as though 16 is representative of what they want to see from a Final Fantasy game. If we look at this before the revenge trailer was published, we can see that just over 80% of respondents said yes, which can be seen as quite positive, but it also means that almost 20% of respondents said no. After the revenge trailer, opinions had softened slightly. The overall opinion had swung 2% in favour of 16 now representing what fans wanted to see, no doubt because they should have Sid, an image of a party, and Moogles. However, when breaking this down by age groups, we can see that after the revenge trailer, only 0.4% more respondents between the ages of 18 and 34 upweighted their views. It meant the big swing came from those aged between 35 and 44. Prior to the revenge trailer, 26.1% or just over a quarter of fans in the 35 to 44 age group said 16 was not representative of what they wanted to see from Final Fantasy, but after a revenge trailer that had dropped to 21.7%. This feels quite representative of change in general though. The development team working on 16 has made a clear decision about how they view the future of Final Fantasy. That future looks to be different from what we're already seeing in both 14 and the 7 remake, something that will no doubt create further divisions amongst the fanbase, but they believe it's the right thing to do. They made this decision many years ago, but they haven't done a very good job, so far at least, of communicating how this change benefits existing fans, nor have they communicated how this aligns with the expectations of players who preferred the older style of games. There's always resistance to change, and there have been detractors throughout every stage of evolution the Final Fantasy franchise has undergone. If you look at the corporate world, even though Microsoft introduced Edge as the web browser of the future back in 2014, it took them a further 7 years before they could finally kill off Internet Explorer as they knew people were still using it and didn't want to ostracise them. Only once the global market share of Internet Explorer was less than 0.5% did they finally pull the plug. That's not to say huge companies don't make mistakes however, as they look to adapt to modern demands, 
There's outrage whenever websites like Twitter and Facebook make big changes to their design, and it's partially why Google has been so successful over the years, as they make a ton of tiny changes over time, blending things wherever they can, as opposed to making extreme changes. And that's how Final Fantasy used to be handled, when releases were more frequent. Fast forwarding to the present day, Final Fantasy XV did attempt to bridge the gap by stating it was a game made for new and old players alike. But with XVI, the language has been much more aggressive. It's being designed for the audience they believe they want, and they have made that quite clear. Gamers who like turn-based games are no longer the target demographic, so their expectations are kind of irrelevant. Bringing things back to the survey, was therefore quite intriguing, and perhaps not even remotely surprising given how passionate and loyal fans are, something that was seen with the Left 4 Dead 2 saga, is that even though almost 20% of respondents did not feel as though 16 represented what they want, 62% of those 20% still said they would end up buying the game regardless of how they feel about it. After taking a top-down view, it's now time to get a bit more under the hood to see how people feel about the different aspects of the game they've seen so far. To do this, we asked for scores relating to music, graphical quality, world design, character design, and the battle system. Before the revenge trailer, fans ordered these elements as follows, with the battle system being seen as the worst element and music seen as the best element. After the revenge trailer, players were more impressed with the battle system, character designs, and graphical quality, with them being so impressed with the latter point that it even usurped music as the highest score element. World design also took a bit of a hit, being the only element to see its score decrease following the release of the new trailer. When looking on a regional level, it's clear why this is the case, as North Americans were very impressed by the graphical update. Those in Asia, however, were not all that pleased with the graphics by comparison, even after the Revenge trailer. However, they were more impressed with the battle system. With characters being such an important part of the experience, we then drilled down further, asking for individual ratings for specific characters. Within each major region, there were some pretty clear trends, but the scores across the board were pretty low, and much lower than the overall score for character design. In every major region, the ordering was the same. Clive Rossfield was first, and Joshua Rossfield was last. Europeans were especially down on Joshua, rating his design at a paltry 68%. After the release of the Revenge trailer, fans were far more impressed with the overall character designs, but on an individual level, there were some harsh overtures. With the inclusion of Sidolphus and Torgal, there were also some differences amongst the regions. Clive remained top of the tree, often joined by Jill and Torgal in the top three. The only region where this differed was Asia, where Benedicta stole the third spot. Amongst the rest, Joshua was still rock bottom, but perhaps the most interesting stat related more to overall points changes. Here, we can see that it was only the designs of Clive and Jill that saw improvements amongst respondents. The designs of every other character were viewed more harshly than they were before the Revenge trailer was published. Next, we'll take a look at icons. Based on what we've learned so far, the icons will take center stage in 16. This will see huge kaiju battles taking place between the icons themselves, but Clive will also have the chance to wield the power of the icons throughout the more traditional combat scenarios. Bahamut was the icon that players are most looking forward to wielding the powers of, However, even though the general trend was the same amongst all major age groups, there were some interesting differences. For example, even though Bahamut still did take the number one spot amongst 18 to 24 year olds, it was nowhere near as pronounced, with Odin not that far behind. This age group also had a stronger affinity with Ifrit. 35 to 44 year olds were also the only age group that had more excitement about wielding abilities associated with the Ice Queen Shiva than Ifrit, which was quite interesting given the prominence Ifra has within the story. Phoenix and Garuda were then often next, and this is quite interesting as it relegates two venerable summons, Ramu and Titan, to the 7th and 8th spot. In the case of Titan, less than 2% selected this particular icon, and it will be interesting to see if players feel the same once the game has been released. With each of the design elements explored, that then points towards the 6 months we have ahead of us and what fans are expecting to see. After the Revenge trailer, 80% of respondents said they had been impressed with Square Enix's marketing efforts so far. However, there were some clear areas where they felt as though the marketing needs to step up. As of right now, the element fans are more keen to learn about is the battle system. Earlier, we showed that this was the element that people had the least confidence about, with regards to what they've seen so far. And so this makes sense, as right now, Square Enix are expecting fans to work on nothing but a few short clips of footage and blind faith that the battle system, which is being overseen by Ryota Suzuki, will not just be good, but good enough to be best in class. 
With the battle system garnering 44% of votes here, next on the list was the world itself. Much has been made about the importance of Valisthea, with time spent introducing the various nations and their motivations. But players want to understand more about how the areas connect to each other, and they also want to learn more about how Clive will interact with these areas. Revenge showed a tease of this, with Clive shown running around the outskirts of the city, but so far there's almost no information as to how this will work, and then be interwoven with Devil May Cry 5 style combat, which is all about ushering players from one encounter to the next in a speedy manner, with proper story exposition then delivered at the end of each chapter. Outside of this, there's still some intrigue about the wider cast of characters and Clive, but with the Revenge trailer doing a much better job of showcasing Clive and the notion of the party style setup we'll see, potential players seem a bit more comfortable about those two areas. And with that, that just about brings us to the end of this particular study. It's certainly been interesting to dive into how people feel about 16 right now, as well as how much the Revenge trailer changed audience perceptions. But even still, it's clear that there's work to be done when it comes to convincing some of the older fans that they will still have a good time with 16 when it releases. Then again, Square Enix may decide it's just not worth the effort, choosing to focus all of their attention on attempting to appeal to as many younger gamers as they can with the hopes of shifting the makeup of the existing fanbase. Time will tell which approach they will take and how effective it will be. Either way, we hope to enjoy this analysis of the data. Thank you so much to everyone who filled out the survey and shared it around, including our good friends, the Nightscope Prince and Blitz. All right, everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube members and supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, the Livestream, Gaussian Di Kujata, Gregory and Lord of Morning, who are super special Onion Eye supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more final fantasy goodness.